2023. We can't put words to how the Lord has moved throughout this year. Sunday morning is just a glimpse into all the Lord is doing. We started this year by launching Front Sight and Encourage, two podcast communities dedicated to the health and growth of men and families. We held a space for married couples by hosting Expectation Marriage Conference. We partnered with neighboring cities to reach our local communities. We hosted two Waterstone Arts semesters and performances. We celebrated Easter weekend where the Holy Spirit fell like rain, literally. Every age and stage was impacted by the gospel that weekend, and that amounted to around 1,900 people. We have continued to innovate ways to broadcast the gospel, including streaming online and growing our digital communities. Ministries like Waterstone Young have grown through consistent community events and messages. Adventure Camp garnered a community of thousands where hundreds of children and leaders made the choice to follow Jesus. And every Sunday, we continue to preach the gospel. Pastor Ron created sermons from five sermon series that brought us out of, through, and into. We have worshiped together, cried together, and been changed together. We also celebrated more than 60 baptisms. And groups like our women's Bible study grew exponentially. We started Waterstone Academy, a new model of education for families. Waterstone, you made this possible. Your obedience to give allows others to experience God. Your obedience to serve shows Him to the world. We are a healthy, vibrant, and authentic body ready to take the next step towards the wonder of His will. We have no choice but to give it our all. 2024, let's wonder. Well, let's step into this. Um, So by the Gregorian calendar that we follow, it's telling you and I that it's the end of a year. Uh, But God's storyline runs uninterrupted meaning he is already ahead of where you and I are, and his knowledge is above and ahead all that we know. I don't know what your thoughts are of today. I don't know what your thoughts are of tomorrow or even in the next few weeks and months, but you need to know this. God is already ahead of you. You need to know that. And so, uh, as you know, I literally live every sermon before Um, I preach it, and the Lord directed me to two psalms this week um, to read. And at the end of each psalm, literally at the end of each reading, something or someone stepped in, showed up, and texted, and just absolutely blew me away. Because I'm like you. I, I can often go into a new year with a little bit of anxiety. I step into next year with a little bit of uncertainty of what does it mean for Waterstone and where we're headed Our key word for next year is greater. Um, So our church runs off of what's called a ministry action plan, just really quickly. Uh, A ministry action plan, a church only has four things, four things, and no more, no less. People, time, buildings, and money. Uh, The average church starts out with how much money they have, and then they determine how much ministry. We don't do that. A ministry action plan identifies where God is working in people, where God is working in time, where he's working in space and buildings. And then we say, Lord, help us figure out how much money is needed to fund that. Often we step out in faith. Sometimes it's ridiculous faith because we feel like that's where the Lord is leading. And last night, all the way up to last night, I'm reading a psalm that God directed me to. And all of a sudden, I open up my phone and there's the bubbles, right? There's the bubble. Somebody's texting me. And they're like, Pastor Ron, I've got somebody that's been watching. They want to give to the academy. They want to give to this. It's a last minute gift. They literally are building schools around the country. Tell me how to give. And immediately I'm like, here's the link. Here's the link, you know. It's not about the money. It's really not. It's about God showing up. And at the last minute, almost at the last hour, when I'm crying out to God like, Lord, am I crazy? Is this ridiculous? Like, I need to hear from you. Psalm 143, oh, God, hear my plea for mercy. God shows up. Listen, God is already ahead of us. God is already ahead of you. Whatever you're about to step into tomorrow, whatever it is you're about to step into next week, January, February, March, I don't know, but God's already there. Ours is to express courageous faith, to find Him and to follow Him so His plan can be fulfilled in you and I. We're starting out with a bold text, if you will. So find in your Bibles the book of Romans. 
Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. If you know anything about the Bible, Romans is one of those books that is still greatly studied today. Like if you really want to dive deep, jump into Romans 7 and Romans 8. Um, If you're not ready to dive deep, don't do it. We still study that theology that is there. Now here, hang on. We study that so much, but to the early church, listen, to the early church, this was brand new and they got it. They didn't have to go to seminary, if you will. Like they went to God school. Like they followed God. They listened to God. They obeyed God. So what you and I are about to read, Paul was literally writing to them in their ears and heart heard for the first time and they understood it. So if you can... I want you to think like you're the early church. I don't want you to think like we come to a building and we get really nice coffee and we don't have to worry about the Roman Empire, if you know what I mean. Like try to think like the early church. Like I have just discovered Christ and he is everything to me. And everything that this world has to offer is not what I want. And what I need and what I have found and what I have discovered is a personal relationship in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to give everything I have to that. And I'm going to step out in courageous faith. If you can think like that, you'll get this message. Listen to Romans chapter 1 verse 16. There's two verses we're going to read. Verse 16 and verse 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. There it is. Can we just stop right there? For I am not ashamed of the gospel. There is a God who sent his son, who died on the cross, who was buried, who is resurrected, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, who is waiting one day to return to capture us, if you will, who desires a personal relationship with you and I so that all things might be restored in him, unto him, and for him. That's the gospel. I'm not ashamed of that. For it is the power of God. Listen, do you think you need power to go in the next year? Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Live out what God has called. For salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Listen to verse 17. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. Listen to that. It's in living out the gospel on a daily basis, pursuing Christ in a relationship with him, that you not only receive power, but in receiving that power, the righteousness of God is revealed, watch this, from faith, hang on to this statement, for faith. Now that may be translated, we're going to get into it in just a moment, that may also be translated from faith to faith. But either two or four, both work and both are accurate. I'm going to show you that in just a moment. From faith, for faith, as it is written... The righteous shall live by their paycheck. The righteous shall live by their emotions. The righteous shall live by what they see with the eye. Fill in the blank. No, the Bible says what what do you and I live by? The righteous shall live by faith. So therefore, if that's how we live, it is that that we need. And if that is what we need, we need to understand it. We need to dive into the Word of God and understand what does that look like? What does courageous faith look like? And what are the steps that we can take? Here's what we know. Number one, what we learn from this is the faith of God, faith for God, faith in God, makes grace continual. Hang on. Give me time to explain that. Oh, my goodness. Listen, faith is not a grace of luxury. It is a grace of necessity. Do you understand that? In other words, we often think... We often misapply grace, if you will. We often think grace is given when I stumble and fall, and I look up quickly and ask, I hope no one was looking, right? Am I the only one that's ever done that? Like you trip or hit the carpet, and you're like, wow, the the ground jumped up and caught me kind of a thing, right? No, no, and you look around for a moment, and you're embarrassed, and you think, I hope no one was looking, and when they're not, you're like, Well, that filled me with grace. Like, thank you, God, for that. Or we often apply it to grace like I make a mistake. Or maybe you send a text and it autofills some words that you don't want sent. And you're like, how do I edit that? I can't take that back. And then you find out that at least if you have an iPhone in the new feature, you can go in and edit. And you're like, thank you for the grace of God that I can edit that text that was not what it should have been. We often misapply grace. Listen, grace here, grace is not a luxury. Grace is a necessity. What does that mean? That means you and I have to live by and in the grace of God. And it is only through the 
of faith in God and faith for God that the power of God is revealed. And in that power of God that is revealed, you and I, the righteousness of God then is allowing you and I to understand what faith to faith or faith for faith is. So as you're starting a new year by this calendar, next year should start to look dramatically different than this year right now. Because you should be growing in your faith. Faith is something you can measure. Faith is something you can put a line to and say, am I growing in these areas? Am I gro-? Grace is not something that you just receive that is a luxury that helps you get through the day or sort of whitewash mistakes. Faith is a necessity. And the grace of God is a necessity that you and I must have in order to walk in. Faith and the trust of God, listen, must be a habit of the Christian life. You and I often only think we need to receive grace when we sin or when we misunderstand or when we're disobedient. You and I must make faith and faith in God absolutely a habit of the Christian life. What does that mean to make it a habit? Well, just as you would form the habit of working out, you're about to make New Year's resolutions, and that's probably some element of the resolutions, right? As you're about to make New Year's resolutions, as you maybe look at your job, and you're like, I need to improve in this area. Maybe look at your, your uh, relationships or, or school or whatever it might be. You're like, I, this can be a better semester. This can be a better New Year. This can be a different start. Like, I can do things differently. Well, in order to do that, some habits must be established, I must study better. I must communicate better. Like, I need to get these habits down to improve. Well, why do you and I not make faith and and faith in God a habit of the Christian life? So often we only make it when we need it. We only cry out to God when the tears are there. John Maxwell says most of us only change when we feel the heat, not see the light. Most of us will change only when we're pressed by things rather than when we're enlightened by Christ. You and I must make faith and trust a habit of the Christian life. Can I just challenge you that as you go into next year, don't only run to God when you need faith in God. Don't only run to God when you need God to share grace. You need to run to God every day and make it a habit. How do you do that? Make it a habit to get up and present yourself to God every day. I'm just telling you, before your feet hit the bed, before your feet, I mean, before your feet get out of bed and hit the floor, you need to say this. God, this is your day. That's all you need to say. Say, Pastor Ron, it takes me like 30 minutes to wake up. I don't even know where I am until after the third cup of coffee. I'm giving you really simple words to say. Before the, you ever roll out and the feet touch, just say, God, this is your day. Will you make that commitment to do that every day as much as you can? Now, throughout the day, you're literally calling on God. Lord, would you give me wisdom? Would you give me direction? May I hear your voice? Lord, speak to me in text and speak to me in psalms. Speak to me in words. Speak to me in billboards. Uh, let, let others step into my life that they don't know they're speaking to me. But God, I am so absolutely dependent upon hearing your voice. I cannot go a day without hearing your voice. And so today I need to hear your voice. How do you do that? Worship, Bible reading, prayer, communion with others. You and I must make it a habit in our Christian life. Why? Because as Christians, listen to this, as Christians, we should not or do not, we should not trust at some times and then cease to trust at other times. If we'll all admit, that's who we are. We have moments when the season is well and things are going great and it's so easy to trust. There are times when things happen and circumstances and actions around us cause us to question. They cause us to pause. And we're like, okay, God, is this you? And how am I supposed to respond to this? And, and, I, and I know everything is from you, but this right now, I don't understand why it's from you. As Christians, when you make faith and faith in God a habit, it helps you and I not trust at some times and then cease to trust at other times. God is already ahead of you. Ours, our job is to find him where he is working and moving and believe in faith, believe in faith that that is God moving. And if God wants me to step right, but I, I accidentally step left, God will orchestrate me back if I surrender and give my heart to him. Why? The Bible says the righteous live by, the righteous live by, there it is. Remember that. You see, faith, let me explain this. Faith to the early church, watch this, was all the senses. The five senses. Think about this for a moment. 
They didn't have the commodities that you and I have. They didn't have sort of a, a journal. They didn't have social media. They didn't have sort of groups. Groups were forming. We know the Bible says they met from house to house. Like they were still meeting in the temple from day to day. And, the, and house churches were forming and, and churches were beginning to form. But they didn't have sort of the modern luxuries of the church community that you and I have. Now, so much of this was brand new to them. So the Bible equated and helped them understand what it meant to live by faith by showing them if you have this sense of sight, of touch, of smell, of hearing, and so forth, then this is how faith is activated. Let me explain it this way. The natural man has eyes, but by faith Christians see him who is invisible. Faith and faith in God means learning to see beyond what the natural eye sees. Certainly, every one of us can wake up and, and question God. We can question Him in the news headlines. We can question Him in the political arena. We can question, question Him in health. So many areas of life, we can look at it and say, God, I don't know. Like, I, I, there's, a, there's a part of me logically that I get it that you're God, but emotionally or circumstantially, like, I, I, there, I don't know. The Bible is telling you and I that faith to the early church, and they demonstrated it, was all the senses. The natural man has hands and feelings. But we live by faith, taking the hand of the one who holds us. How often this year would you go back and reflect and say that I actually took things from the hand of God, if you will, by taking things into my own hands and trying to maneuver or move or manipulate or master. I took some things from the hands of God so that things might be a little bit more predictable are safe, are comfortable for me, rather than just letting go of all of that and saying, God, you are in control. I trust your hands more than I trust my hands. Even though I can see my hands at work, I'm choosing to trust the activity of your hands over mine. The natural man has ears, hearing pleasing sounds. Our ears are to be tuned to hear the voice of God. If there's one thing you and I can learn, it is to learn and discern the voice of God in everything. You have to trust me as your pastor in this. There are going to be times when you are surrounded by so many voices. I'm going to tell you what you do. I'm going to tell you what you do. You don't move on anybody else's voice until you get the peace of God in your heart that that's God's voice. Don't move. Don't make a decision. There's going to be great logic around you. There's going to be pros and cons. There's going to be awesome voices around Godly voices around you. But not until you've sat in that position for a moment and said, God, I absolutely need to know that this is your voice. Don't move. Don't act. Sit and wait for the voice of God. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You're going to go through some questionable moments. The mind's just going to, just going to, it's going to do some weird stuff for you. If, if, there's going to be some dark moments. There's going to be some high moments. But I'm going to tell you, if you'll wait and get through that, when God speaks to you in that absolute moment, and you're surrounded by all these voices and all these circles, I'm telling you, when God speaks to you, what that does for your faith is it encourages you to continue to wait to hear the voice of God. There is nothing more powerful, nothing more personal, nothing that is more alive in you than the voice of God. You have to surrender and submit to the Scriptures. You have to surrender and submit to worship. You have to lift up Christ in everything you do, despite what everyone else is saying around you. Now, let me put this in parentheses. Hang on. That doesn't give you free license to do what you always want to do. Yeah. I get it. Some people have said, well, I heard all this good advice around me, but I chose this path. That's wrong. I'm not saying for you to choose your own path in spite of the voices. I'm saying you sit and wait for the voice of God to be confirmed and heard in your heart and your life. I know the next question. Well, Pastor Ron, how will I know what's his voice? Can I lovingly be a pastor? If you're asking that, you've not heard his voice enough. You will know what's his voice. You will know what's his voice. And listen, God does not change his voice. 
He doesn't call and do prank phone calls and, and hi, hi, got you. I just want to see if you'd recognize my voice. God doesn't do that. To you, God speaks the same every time. And the longer you are in communication with him, the more familiar you are with his voice. And sometimes you're, you're probably not going to hear it audibly. I don't know that I've ever actually heard it like audibly like they did in the Old Testament. You know what I mean? Like it didn't come down like Charlton Heston in the movie, you know, Moses, that kind of a deal. That's, that's not what I mean. But you'll hear it. It literally will reverberate throughout your entire body. Why? Because the Bible says he knows you. He knows your frame. You are but dust. And when God speaks to you, every cell of your body comes alive. You and I need to get hooked on hearing the voice of God. Why? Because the habitual grace-filled faith of like a Job was the only sense that he had. And you and I, like, like the early church, need to rest and trust in God. Faith to the early church was, listen, first... And last, it was all they had. Can you say that? We are at the end of a year by a calendar. So if you were going to put a bookend or a period or something at the end of this year. So as you and I step forward in that, you need to understand as you start this year, faith must be the first thing you start with tomorrow and the last thing you end 2024 with. The first thing you start your day with and the last the first thing you start a thought with and the last thing you finish that thought with. Do not leave thoughts un, sort of out there open without being closed by the word of God or the confirmation of God or the peace of God or the silence of God or the waiting on God. Don't step in and take it by yourself into your own hands. Absolutely trust the heart of God. What do I mean by that? Our faith begins by looking to and seeing Christ and Christ alone. We come to life because of whom we see. You understand that? As we live by faith. Listen, we expect to die by faith, looking for his coming. Faith and trust, or faith and faith in God, is the, tr listen, is the truest expression of God being to us the Alpha and the Omega. Go back, if you will. Where do I get that from? Literally the phrase in verse 17, from faith to faith. Lily, if you study that, if you break that down, Lily, what this means is when it says from faith to faith, it literally means first to last, start to finish. That's literally what that means. It means as you started in Christ by faith, so you will finish with Christ by faith. Nothing ever changes. That, thing, that is the common denominator. And so everything about your life is just increasing and growing in faith. That's why the word to can be used, faith to faith, start to finish, or faith for faith, because it denotes both, that as I'm starting the race, so I will finish the race. As I'm in the race, I'm going to grow in the race of Christ. Does that make sense? Both the words to and for work in that, because faith to you and I is everything. It is the first and the last. It is the start and the finish. Now, once again, notice he's talking to new believers. He's, talking, he's not talking to experienced Christians. He's not talking to experienced church attenders. He's literally, you're saying, Pastor Ron, this is a little over my head. It was over their head as well, but that didn't stop them. What that meant was, God, this may be over my head, but you're in my heart. Amen. And I'm going to trust your voice and trust that in stepping out in obedience toward things I don't know, but I'm stepping towards someone I do know. That all of this will be revealed to me. The question is, are you willing to step out in obedience and faith and trust in God and live from faith to faith, from first to last, from start to finish? Here we are at the end of a year, at the beginning of a new. Will you do that? Here's what we know. Courageous faith will be tested and tried. There's a reason why I didn't start with that one as point number one. <laughs> because you and I often, well, can we just admit it, sort of give up and surrender when faith is tested and tried. No one likes that. Everything about my life is an illustration. Can I just share this with you right now? The glasses that I'm wearing have broken four times. <laughs> and this morning at about 5 o'clock, they fell on the ground. And I heard the lens slide across the floor. And I'm like, I have extreme bifocals. I won't be able to read the Bible without that. And so I'm trying to put this thing together. I'm calling Rain. I'm like, find the glue, find this or that. Paul walks in the door and he's like, good morning. And I'm like, good morning. I'm like, I need help. We start yelling down the hallway. Paul goes and gets Gorilla Glue. And thank God, thank God and Gorilla Glue, I can see you. 
Is that a rhyme? I don't know. <laughs> Thank God in Gorilla Glue, I can see you. Everything about that. My first response this morning was, really? How often do you do that when things happen? You're like, really, God? I literally just put my faith and trust in you. I heard you speak through a psalm. That was an awesome moment. And the next thing you wake up, and you're like, really, God? Really this? Courageous faith will be tested. Now, that's not an extreme test. That's a goofy test of glasses, if you know what I mean. But I'm using me as an illustration that nonetheless, your faith will be tested and tried. Why? Because it has to be. That's how it's strengthened. It's not just strengthened on the mountaintop. It's strengthened in the valleys. And do you not know the Christian life is a journey of both going up and down? You will never stay in the valley forever, and you will never stay on the mountaintop forever. You were made to cross both up and down. You were made to traverse both up and down so that God can reveal himself to you on both locations. But do we not learn so much about him in those dark moments? Absolutely. The Bible tells you and I, courageous faith will be tested and tried. Why? Because faith in God outlives God trials. Nothing else outlives trials. Human effort, human will, human intellect, self-help, none of that outlives trials. Like I honestly don't know how people do it in life without life in Christ. I honestly and truly don't. The Bible tells you and I that courageous faith will be tested and tried. Now listen, the point of the cross, don't miss this. The point of the cross wasn't just new life in Christ. Getting your fire insurance, getting saved, making sure I skip hell and go to heaven. But the defeating, listen, of all that seeks to destroy us. Do you get that? There are going to be days when you feel like there's a whole lot of stuff out there to destroy you. I get it. You're going to wake up some days and, and, and you're saying, I know, I know I'm supposed to put my feet on the ground, but right now, like, my head emotionally is a mess. My heart is, is a mess. My stomach has been tossing and turning all night. Whatever. Like, I get that. We've all been there. But the Bible tells you and I that faith from first to last, from start to finish, is a faith that outlives trials. And the point of the cross wasn't just to get you to heaven, but while we're here, to destroy everything that seeks to destroy us. In Christ, we can outlive the trials of this world. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We know that verse. We quote it often in the good times. But boy, when we're pressed, and we've all been pressed, when we're all stressed, and we've all been stressed, when we're perplexed, discouraged, depressed, that's when faith matters the most. Remember, faith is not just a grace. It's not a, faith and grace is not a luxury. It's a necessity because life's going to do what life does. And it's going to press. It's going to perplex. It's going to distress. It's going to discourage. But faith in Christ outlives and outlasts trials. Why is this so important? Because the faith that does not outlive or the faith that does not withstand trials is a faith not worth having. You think about that. What is your faith in right now? Is your faith in the stock market? Good luck. Is your faith in the next political election? Good luck. That's going to change every four years or eight years. That's right. Have we not learned that yet? I mean, if you're watching the Dow, it's up and down. I mean, come on. We know these lessons. Your own emotions are going to be up and down. Just naturally, your own medical condition is going to be up and down. This world is going to be up and down. You can have a good day one day with some folks, and then the next day you're like, where are we? That's life. You understand that. But the constant in all, the constant in all this is faith in God. And if the faith that you have is not outliving or withstanding trials, you need to check what faith you have. And this is the best time of the year to do that. Where does my faith reside? What is my faith placed in? Is it in Christ and Christ alone? Can I ask you this question? If you were to die tonight, God forbid, do you absolutely know that if this was your last breath here on earth, that you would die and go to heaven Not based upon you thought you were a good person and you thought God forgave you, but only on this, that the Bible says that you have confessed your sins, you have called out to Christ, you have said, God, redeem me and restore me and forgive me and renew me. I don't want to do this life without, like, not just I'm a good person, I've kind of always felt like God was around me, and, well, God and I are just kind of a thing. No, absolutely not. 
Oh, I'm a friend of God. That's dangerous terms, right? We understand that. Now, what does it mean here? It means, have you come to that place where the heart has truly said, God, I am a sinner. And my eyes realize that I am separated from you. And my repentance and trust and faith in you, my hand of, of faith reaching up to your hand of grace that is extended is what closes the gap to seal my heart so that when I do breathe my last breath, I know I will be in your presence, not based upon what I did, but the decision that I made to trust you. Don't go into another year with that eternal uncertainty come to christ commit your life to him why because courageous faith ultimately in god will be victorious the righteous shall live by faith the righteous shall live by faith Do you understand this it is impossible to trust god too much it is impossible to trust god too much think about that statement for just a moment you, you, can't, you can't give enough to God. You, you can't trust enough to God. You can't rely on, you can't go to him enough. You can't hear from him enough. You and I will never reach the end of trusting God because there is no end in God. He is the alpha and the um, omega. He is the first to last, start to finish. This year, as you, are, as you begin to go into the next year, just know this. You cannot trust God too much. You cannot lay your crowns down enough or often enough. You and I must learn to trust him even when it seems absolutely ridiculous. Why? Because we can and have placed too much trust in others. And we can and have placed too little trust in God. Wow. If you would just write that on, on a piece of paper and put it on your refrigerator and, and make that as an encouraging note for the next year, to not put too much trust in others and put too little trust in God. You need to put too little trust in others and more trust in God. Amen? Amen. So what then is the benefit of faith in God? Like, well, I don't, what, what is the benefit of that? Well, here it is. The benefit of the faith in God is God's always the same. God is always the same. You've got great friends around you. I'm sure you've got a great marriage. You've got great friendships. You've got great community. But, but none of them can be as faithful and as always as God is. God is the only constant that you and I will ever have in this life. He's always the same. Right? If, if he can be trusted one day, he can be trusted all the other days. We need to know that. We need to learn that. 2024 is going to hold some challenging days. It's going to hold some rewarding days. We know we've lived these years before. The constant in all the years is Christ and placing faith in him. Faith, listen to this, faith Always trust God, not outward events. Faith always places its trust in God, not in outward events. Life's going to do what life's going to do. It's going to bring uncertainty. There are going to be things that just happen and words that are said and relationships that come and go and things that happen. But you and I must learn to stand firm and stay close to God. Here's how you do that. Understand this. The Word of God is readable, but the works of God are unreadable. Meaning, as you get into the Word of God, it's going to help you interpret and decipher the movement of God. I pray this all the time. Lord, I'm not a very smart man, and I want you to fly an airplane by like I do it, they do at New Smyrna Beach, announcing how much crab is on sale and go to Joe's Crab Shack, whatever. Like, I, I, want, I need that. God, I, I need you to fly a plane over to my house that says, hey, Ron, do this today. Anybody else need that? I mean, I literally am like, spell it out to me like that. Like, now, God's never done that to me yet, but you know how he has done it? Through the constant revelation of his word. Like when he told me to read Psalm 112 and Psalm 143, I didn't understand it. But I said, okay, I'm going to read it. And as I read it, I literally watched God do what was written in those Psalms. Every one of them. And I stood in amazement. That, that, that's what happens. So when the word of God speaks to you, it helps you understand how God is moving. Without the word of God, you and I are not going to have airplanes that fly by that tell us, hey, this is what God is doing right now. Oh, thanks, that helps a lot. 
It's the word of God that is readable that helps us understand and interpret the movement of God that is unreadable. Does that make sense? I get it. You and I, like, uh, we like to follow maps. We like to put in destinations and, and here and there. And, and I feel like, you know, uh, maybe my brain is not as smart as it used to be because now I don't, how to, I don't know how to get anywhere anymore because I rely on a digital device. Did anybody ever grow up reading maps goes or real maps where you had to look at the highways and mom and dad threw a big old map in the back to you and said, hey, find out where we are. And you open that thing and it was like four by four. And you're like, where in the world are we? You know, well, now we don't have to think. We just punch in numbers, and there it is. Like, I don't know anybody's phone number. I only know you by name. So like, right? I tell the female digital assistant, hey, Siri, hey, Alexa, hey, Ivana, whatever their names are. Like, I talk to somebody and say, call them. Like, if you were to ask me what your number is, I don't know. My point is that's sometimes how God works. We just call on God, and God shows us. And God may not always give you a map, but he does give you his word. And you can always trace his actions, listen, based upon the word that he has already revealed to you. If you want to see where God is moving next year, get into the word of God. What do I mean by that? Be wise. Trust and believe in the God. Listen, you cannot see. Trace his activity, not always the actions around you. Notice that. Trace his activity. Where is God moving? Not necessarily the actions around. Like, look at the life of Job. Job had to only trust the activity of God, not the actions. If Job would have traced the actions, he would have denounced the activity of God. You and I must learn to trust his activity, not always the actions that are around us. No one, and learn this, no one was ever recorded in the Bible saying this. I was a fool to trust in God. Rather, the Bible says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. But no one was ever recorded in the word of God as saying, I made a mistake. I was a fool. Why did I trust God? Many have trusted in wealth and been disappointed. Many have relied on friends and been betrayed. Blessed is the one who trusts in God. Let's use Job as we close. In Job 1, verse 21, he says, The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. I can't think of a better blessing as you get ready to walk into a new year. Amen? There are going to be times when things are taken. There are going to be times when things are given. But blessed be the name of the Lord. I loved that sermon bumper where it did a quick review. It was numbers. It was moments. I mean, 60 baptisms. The number of new members that joined. The number of new ministries started. Hey, front sight men, the women's Bible study is still larger than us. Just saying. But 13,000 unique followers in front sight, men's ministry. What God is already doing in the heart of men to strengthen the home and strengthen the marriage and to strengthen their walk with God. Those are all numbers and they're all moments, but you know what they reveal? They reveal the activity of God. And next year we're going to turn the corner and we're going to start with the word greater. January is all about greater trust than its greater hope in February, than its greater purpose in March. And that's going to bring us right into Easter. Easter is March 31st. We start thinking about Easter on January the 8th or 9th. And we're ready for it. Amen? Next year is going to be greater. As you and I trust God. As you and I listen to God. As you and I realize that faith is not a grace of luxury. It's a faith of necessity. We cannot, we should not go into next year without trust in God. God and committing to be so familiar with his voice that in the midst of a crowd, in the midst of clamor, in the midst of emotions, in the midst of disruptions, you and I can clearly hear the st st small, still voice of God that's uninterrupted, that's constant. And that's the prayer I have for you. That's the prayer I have for us. That's the prayer I have for this church community. That we would only listen to the voice of God. And I can't wait to see what he's going to do next year. I honestly believe it's greater. The way God is lining things up, I'm just sitting back in amazement of what's about to happen. I'm believing it.
You know why? Because I believe him. Because he's never failed. And he will not fail. He never fails to speak. He never fails to move. He never fails to step in. He never fails to console. He never fails to whisper. And he'll never fail you or I. Amen? Amen.